Hello everyone, Steve Goodwin here. This will be part three for my Rebuilding Panopay series. Uh, if you recall from the first videos, I showed that my father built this boat originally from a bare hull starting in 1975. He followed Tom Colvin plans to the letter and built it as a gaff schooner and no wheelhouse aft. Uh, sometime in the 2000s, I took over the vessel and made radical changes, uh, including a new sloop rig, uh, the, the, the wheelhouse, and I've since gutted most of the interior and rebuilt it at least once, uh, all new systems and so on. It's really been a big, big project. But in this video, we'll pick things up, starting with my projects going back to 2018, through the present here in the summer of 2024. Uh, it's gonna be quite a bit of footage and still shots. Uh, again, lots and lots of projects. Hope you get something useful out of it, enjoy. First up is this 85 foot tri-sail that I added to Panopay's suit of sails. And together with the 75 foot storm jib, uh, this, this combination is great for up to about 35 knots of wind. We should probably call this a gale sail arrangement rather than true storm sails. I'm, I'm not really going offshore. Uh, one would think that with this uh, forward nature of this sail pan, the boat would be having lee helm or a tendency to turn down wind. But I can report that it's very well balanced. Uh, perhaps the wheelhouse aft is acting as sort of a mizzen, or maybe it's just the fact that the very long keel is tolerant of uh, a, a sail imbalance. Next is a dirt project that is related to the vessel. This is a proper boat shed that I constructed so that I can house Panope in the off-season indoors and also be able to do projects anytime and in any weather. I did frame the building conventionally in, uh, in lumber, but I did add some steel architectural effects, including the big doors in which the boat passes in and out. Now, the dimensions of the building were really constrained. Uh, there's just a couple inches either side of the doors, and then the overhead is very close to the top of the wheelhouse. So close that the boom gallows that I constructed back in, oh, about 20 years ago, they were too tall. They would have uh, conflicted with the framing. So they got cut down, or I should say the arch part got cut down, which required this new crutch to be constructed quite a bit taller. Of course, it retains that pivoting down position for sailing and, of course, backing into the shed. Here I'm measuring the propeller aperture for the eventual fitment of a new feathering max prop propeller. Here's a shot of the cabin just on the forward side of that main bulkhead. That's forward of the table there. Uh, there used to be a head, but that got changed. The head is now way up in the far forward of the boat. And so what it means is I now could open up the cabin. I, I'm, I'm really liking open spaces more than chopped up cabins in boats lately. So I played around with different shapes and settled on sort of an ellipse finished off the edge uh, in oak as my father had done on the rest of the interior 40 plus years ago and the results came out fine. If someone does need some privacy, there is a curtain that can be drawn. Here I am finishing out the oak edge trimming of the starboard settee bunk. Those uh, corners got sawn out with a hole saw and then just finished off the outer edge with a sander. Came out nice. One thing it features is a removable backboard. It's an oak plank that fits into slots and then it can be removed and placed in the inboard edge of the bunk to make a sea rail. Here I have added a 12 volt air cooled refrigeration system to the ice box. I have to say that is very convenient and it does free up space in this otherwise very tiny and very well insulated ice box. Uh, for overflow stuff, fruits and vegetables, they can go down in the bilge. That works out just fine. This is a cabin heater that converts waste heat from the engine cooling system into massive amounts of nice hot air for the cabin. It's mounted up forward and it blows aft and really does a nice job. Here you can see the red plumbing there on the engine. That is the pickup from the coolant system. This is a new pivoting bowsprit that I built out of aluminum pipe. Pivots up at the dock for lower fees and it pivots down so that it can fit into the shop without having to remove it. 
One thing that's unique is that the pivoting point or the hinge is far forward of the attach point to the gunnel there. That's done so that the bowsprit can pivot upward and not interfere with the bow pulpit or stanchions. The working jib that I've been using with the new bowsprit does not have ideal dimensions. It's a second hand unit and as you can see it's a bit short on luff, maybe about two feet short, and perhaps a bit more foot could be used as well. But in spite of that it works really well. Not sure the boat is any faster but it does point a few degrees higher and of course the balance is fantastic with that center of effort being just a bit farther forward. Now eventually for light air I will use a drifter. As a proof of concept I taped blue tarp to my old staysail stay drifter and did get an hour or two of sailing in before it disintegrated and boy that was a real powerhouse in light air. Now you might be wondering, how will I get out to the end of the bow sprit to set and strike hanked on head sails? And the answer is, I don't go out to the end of the bow sprit. I simply bring the bow sprit to me via the pivoting action. You can see I'm hardening up the bobstay tackle, but only temporarily and lightly with the, with the windlass there. I then hoist the sail, and it's just a one-to-one -one halyard with no winches, so I can't get very much luff tension, but that's okay. It gets cleated off there at the mast, and then the final tensioning of both the head stay or jib stay and luff happens via the windlass, and it's very powerful. I've got four-to-one tackle on the bob stay combined with the power of the winch, and that's just as tight as it needs to be. For striking sail, I just simply pull it down by hand. I tried using a downhaul for a while, and it was certainly very nice to bring it all down snugly, but it was an extra string that I just don't feel was necessary. Once I get it down most of the way, I just cast off the bobstay tackle and bring the whole lump aboard. This sail doesn't get used in more than about 15 knots of wind, so that's never a problem with flogging. I suppose if a squall came up, I could have a little bit of a handful on my hands, but note those really high guard rails are pipe rails there on the foredeck. It's a nice safe place to work even with a flogging sail. Okay, what in the world is going on here? No, I am not fixing a problem with the keel. What's happening is I am converting this formerly empty build space in the keel into fuel tankage and there's two main reasons for doing this. One is to be able to finally access and close off this, again, empty build space, which was completely unreachable. But the primary goal here with creating this fuel tankage is to not add fuel capacity, but to get the fuel lower to improve the stability of the vessel. Now, while I was doing this, again, it was a chance for me to inspect and, you know, get a good look for the first time down in this space. And sure enough, I did find a corrosion problem. That's the stern post, if you will. It's just a piece of tube used to create the back edge of the keel. And buried inside it was this iron cold chisel. It was probably dropped in there during the original build. Fortunately, it didn't corrode the exterior skin of the boat, so I was able to just clean out the rust and weld over that hole in that tube, and everything was just fine. So those three spaces are separated by bulkheads, but they have generous limber holes, so consider that one tank of approximately 42 gallons. Now in these shots, the camera is in the wheelhouse looking down into the footwell. At the top of the screen, there are those three red battery switches, they are mounted on the inboard face of one of the main fuel tanks and all that stuff is going away here for this new fuel system and as it turns out we'll be replacing most of the other systems as well. So I built these fuel tanks more than 20 years ago and I installed them prior to any of the woodwork engine or systems installations and what it meant is is that they wouldn't come out without cutting them up so with a skill saw chopped them in half, and then brought all the pieces out one at a time.
So each of these two tanks weighed 60 pounds, and because they were located well above waterline, not only are we getting fuel lower, we are just eliminating quite a bit of metal from up high. So that's yet another stability increasing factor. Notice that brown staining on the inside of that tank. That is the only effect that the diesel had on this tank after more than 20 years of, of fuel being in there. Um, the bottom of these tanks is shaped like a V, and the fuel pickup is right at the very bottom of the tank. So the fuel would just gravity right out of there, along with any water that collected. The water would immediately just end up in the filters, and what it meant was no diesel bug no rotting carcasses, no black sludge, and no corrosion. So with the propeller shaft removed, I decided to replace the cutlass bearing. It only had a thousand hours on it, and it wasn't worn at all, so I could have left it in place, but I wanted to get an, uh, a chance to inspect the stern tube. This cutlass bearing was installed with epoxy only, no set screws, and as you can see, it was a rather unconventional removal process. Here I am harvesting aluminum plate from the old fuel tanks. This piece is one of the three top plates that get welded into the keel to form the top of the new keel fuel tank. Now the cramped location of this welding project made it extremely difficult to film correctly. But I say it was even harder to weld it correctly. Now, I'm not a professional welder by any stretch, and often my welds look pretty amateurish, and this was no exception. I ended up doing multiple passes on these top plate welds with the assumption that there would be pinholes and leaks. So rather than try to chase them down, I just loaded it up with lots and lots of weld material. This is a shot underneath the weld plates down in the keel tank. This is looking straight down at the keel bottom. We see those little spots. Those are very shallow corrosion pits here and there. I didn't really do anything to try to repair those pits. I just simply uh, wire wheeled everything and epoxied the bottom of the tanks. This fitting provides three functions. It is the fuel tank pickup tube, the fuel filler pipe, and then it also closes off the only current access into these fuel tanks and that is the aftermost top plate. Now in the future better larger access could be added to those other two top plates but for now we'll just run it like this. This is the pickup tube in place and you can see that it pokes right back down into the extreme aft and lowest point of the tank. It's only about a quarter inch off from the bottom and with the high volume transfer pump, my hope is that I will be able to slurp up almost all of the water that will almost certainly make its way into this keel tank. Here I'm cutting away the original rudder gudgeon, and although the wear was not too much, certainly could have gone probably another 50 years, I really wanted to clean up the hydrodynamics of that rudder gudgeon area and all along the leading edge of the rudder. Yep, sure enough, they cut out a disc of plastic for the to t t take the load and minimize wear. So to replace this lower gudgeon, I'm going to use this pipe here, same 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 dimensions. Um, I'm going to leave it long, and what's going to happen is I'm going to slice away a big portion of it, and the the final result 
will be for once I will I will get rid of this large gap you know I can see uh, water passing by here having to negotiate this and again the idea with this piece is to be slit in half down until we get to the gudgeon portion and that will sort of hug the rudder post and then I will fill in the space with metal and weld it everywhere uh, again this is for hydrodynamics just nicer flow across this gap So once I got the keel all buttoned up, I pressurized it to a few pounds with my kayak pump and with soapy water identified numerous pinhole leaks that were drilled out to a little divot and then re-welded. Sometimes it took multiple tries. I was dealing with old metal and it was certainly not perfect welding. So the propeller shaft measured a couple thousandths undersize in the area of the cutlass bearing. And although this is still usable, I decided to replace it with a brand new unit that was left over from my place of work. Uh, I had to cut down the end at the engine side or the coupling side, cut a new keyway. Here I am center punching for the grub screw divot. This is a shallow hole in the end of the shaft that the grub screws uh, fit into. I think it's pretty important to get these nice and deep and well fitting because it's the only thing that keeps your shaft from backing out of the boat when you're in reverse. It's probably overkill to true up the face of the coupling, but when you have a friend with a nice lathe, what the heck. Here's the new propeller shaft in place. Note the new dripless stuffing box. Also note the really close proximity of the shaft to the diesel fuel pipe. I actually put a small dent in the fill pipe to provide a bit of clearance. Here's a sketch of the new fuel system proposal. Starting in the lower right, we have the keel tank, and fuel flows up through the pickup tube, through a large Raycor filter separator, and via a manual transfer pump, and down into the day tank in the center of the drawing. 
So engine fuel flows out of the day tank through the extreme bottom along with any water or debris and it hopefully will get caught there in that water trap which can be drained off. From there it flows out through another Raycor filter and then onto the engine which itself has yet another filter. Uh, there is a furnace in the drawing in, say, the middle right side of the picture. It draws its fuel from the day tank via gravity, no electric pump required, and it flows via a short standpipe, which means that the furnace can never draw down the very last bit of day tank fuel, thus starving the engine. Next project is construction of the day tank with 3 16 aluminum that was salvaged from the main fuel tanks. Here's the bottom with its V-shape engine outlet at the extreme bottom and that aforementioned standpipe for the furnace fuel supply. So here's the finished tank. Note the sight glass along the side. Also the alternate filler port. That's so that I can fill the tank via a dock hose or a jerry can in case the main keel tank becomes unusable for whatever reason. Here's the tank in its final position. Note the Raycor 900 there on the right side. It got welded directly to the tank side. And that's the filter that goes between the keel tank and this day tank. Fuel gets there via that gray pump in the upper right. It needed a special bracket for mounting. Also note that there is a second pump. That's the blue bilge pump that faces it. And the actuation of these two pumps is via this slot, which is accessed in the wheelhouse underneath the starboard settee bench. Here's a short film on how that all works. Here's a new platform for the house bank batteries. It's in a new location just aft of the pilot house companionway steps. Note the hold down, which one end lodges underneath a heavy teak cap, and the other end is fixed via a through bolt through the stern post and fixed with a wing nut. This is, allows tool-free access to the batteries for watering. I relocated the battery switches to the front side of the galley bulkhead. This is a lot more accessible than the previous location in the footwell. Here's the back side. Note those jumper bars rather than jumper cables between the switches. And here's an overview shot. Uh, believe me, I'm the last person that wants to intermingle saltwater plumbing with electrical equipment, but I just couldn't find another eloquent way to do it. I'll just have to take care to keep that water on the inside of that plumbing. Here's the pilot house sole and companionway steps, which I built with starboard. And although this stuff looks nice and clean when it's on the outside of the boat in the rain, on the inside of the boat, I found it to be impossible to keep clean. The non-skid bumps just trap dirt and mud, and I, I was just chasing it constantly. So all that's getting ripped out, and I'm going to go with a wood surface instead. So the aluminum pilot house sole framework and motor box will be unchanged. Here is a pattern being made for the new wooden sole. This is oak veneered plywood, which is not the best quality wood, it turns out. So the edges were heavily epoxied, and we'll just hope for the best on keeping rot at bay. Here's some heavy oak trim on which the engine box hold downs were mounted. These simply bump off to the side with a palm or your foot and then allows the motor box to pivot up and out of the way without tools. Here are new pilot house footrests and they engage into these tapered thumbs that fit into a tapered socket on the underside of the footrest. So these can be removed and installed very quickly without tools. 
And once again, I stress that I am becoming disenchanted with walls, enclosures, drawers, doors, and other things that chop up the inside of boat spaces. I want things to be open and airy so that I can see them and quickly grab them. If there's gear or equipment that needs to be held in place, I'm more inclined to do it with a net rather than another wall or a door. This is a hull zinc that was bolted to a drilled and tapped solid block of aluminum that itself was welded to the outside of the hull. Well, I'm on a bit of a hydrodynamic kick, so I've ground off those blocks and then re-welded them to the inside of the hull. And then, of course, the mounting bolts for the zinc pass through the hull skin and into the block. This propeller aperture was one of the first metalworking projects I did on the boat, and frankly, it was a little crude. So I've added epoxy-based filler to sort of smooth out those facets, welds, and other ugly things to this aperture and rudder leading edge. So the sogging witch design requires that the plating in the forward portion of the bottom be uh, executed in strips and in this case these were lapped over each other and welded along the seam. Now this seam is not perpendicular to the flow of water so I wanted to make this a little smoother. And with this batten temporarily held in place I was able to squeegee along that seam and form sort of a wedge shaped bit of epoxy based filler. The hull to keel joint, or rabbit, was also filled along with the intersection of the keel bottom and keel sides, which was quite crude from the original factory welding back in the mid-70s. So for the past 12 years or so of intermittent seasonal use, I have not been using any anti-fouling or po poisonous bottom paint. Instead, I've just been scrubbing from a beach or from the dinghy. But now I have used bottom paint. It is Micron CF, and note how bumpy it is. I can report, after making very careful speed checks under power, this is both before and after all of these hull changes, I report that there is no change in speed. So the big question is, is did all those hydrodynamic cleanups that I did not have an effect at all, or was the the extra speed they provided negated by the bumpiness of the paint So as someone with more than a passing interest in anchors, I've decided to modify the bow roller so that all anchors, including those with very large roll bars, can be used in conjunction with the new bow spread. So what was needed was the ability to lower the bow roller so that the anchor roll bar would be underneath the bow spread. Here's a plywood or cardboard mock-up of the proposed roller cheek extension. Here's half-inch plate fitted up ready for welding. So I settled on four positions for the anchor roller. In the lowest position, the 55-pound Mantis M1 works perfectly. In the second position from the top, the 118-pound Bruce is a good fit. And in the third position from the top, a 45-pound Rockna or 45-pound Spade works just fine. To prevent chafe on the snubbers or other ropes, I've added a one inch rod to the edge of the roller cheeks. Now the trick with bending al aluminum is getting it hot, but not too hot. And it doesn't really change color, so there's no feedback before it melts away. So the trick is to heat it up while you're trying to bend it. And once it starts getting easy to bend, it becomes real obvious and you get the shapes that you want. This, of course, was all welded inside and out and ground smooth, uh, makes for a nice tidy edge, and again, no chafe for the snubbers. 
The roller shaft is one inch solid stainless rod. Note the zerk fitting on the end which is drilled down the center for greasing and also note the peg there and the corresponding holes in the roller cheek that keeps the shaft from spinning. In the lower left you'll see that tube that I welded to the bow. It's off-centered to starboard a bit and it accepts the tip of a 55 pound Mantis M1. Inside of that tube I filled with 5200 and let it cure so it's got a nice rubber bumper so to speak. This new bollard replaces the previous one that was murdered during the reworking of the foredeck. It mounts just to the port side of the new anchor roller slot, if you will, and it's designed to take snubber loads or in a pinch, I suppose you could even wrap the chain road around it directly. This is 310 feet of new 5/16 G4 anchor chain. It replaces 160 feet of 3/8 chain, and although it's a smaller size, uh, the the much longer length means it needed more volume. So this is an extension or raising of the anchor locker divider, and it separates the two chains. That's the primary road on the right and the secondary road on the left. Again, that taller divider keeps them separate. So in spite of my best efforts to ensure that the new smaller chain would work in the old windlass's chain wheel, it was a bust and the chain was skipping on deployment. Now I've chose a Simpson, correction, I chose a Lofrens Royal to replace the old Simpson Lawrence 555 windlass and it's working out just fine. It's only single speed but it seems to be a nice compromise. It's not too slow coming up but it does have adequate power. I added a second muffler to the engine exhaust. It mounts right near the exit through the transom. And although it wasn't a huge difference, it was noticeable. And, of course, it was easy enough to install since I had such a generous long straight length of exhaust hose. Last thing I'll talk about is not a building project per se. Rather, it is an experiment. What I've done is measured panape shroud tension under sail. As you can see, there's only one shroud per side, so it was a simple matter of replacing the turnbuckle with a load sensor, the readout for which I ran inside the wheelhouse there, and along with that inclinometer, I was able to get real-time measured uh, shroud tension at various angles of heel. I did this test on separate days where one day was full sail in light wind and then on another day with uh, oh up to about 25 knots with a deeply reefed main and just a staysail. And I'm going to go ahead and show you the numbers and if you want to use them to sort of get an idea of what your boat's shroud tension is, keep in mind that this vessel is a bit more tender than usual. It is 34 feet long. It weighs about 15,000 pounds. Uh, the beam is fairly narrow. It's only about 9 feet at the waterline. Uh, ballast displacement ratio is 33% and it only draws 4 feet. So again, all, all those numbers tell you it's probably a bit more tender than a typical 34 foot sailboat. But nonetheless, these are the numbers. There's two lines there for both the reefed and the full sail conditions. And naturally we would expect the 
reefed numbers to be smaller shroud tension because uh, when the sail is reefed, more of the healing force will be transferred to the hull via the mast partners rather than the shrouds. All right, that gets us up to speed on the projects. No doubt there will be more in the future, but it might be a few years before I get enough material for a meaningful video. There could be a anchor video on the horizon, so look out for that. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. So long.